Hey everyone, welcome to our new topic on the people who helped lead to the theory of evolution. We're going to talk about three key players, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, Charles Darwin, whose picture you see here. This is the younger picture of Charles Darwin. You will see a picture of him when he's older that you might um, recognize a little bit more. Um, when we talk about Charles Darwin, we'll also talk how he was influenced by Hutton, Malthus, Lyell, and Wallace. And then we'll conclude by talking about Stephen Jay Gould. Let's start with Jean-Baptiste Jean Lamarck. So Jean-Baptiste Lamarck is a scientist who in the early 1800s proposed this idea that by using or not using a certain body part, organisms would either acquire or lose that certain trait during their lifetime and then pass it on to their offspring. Now, think about that. That basically means, let's say you have this crab, he starts using his claw a lot. So that's, you know, selective use. He's using this claw a lot. So then his claw grows bigger because he's using it a lot. And then he has babies and he passes that big claw trait onto his offspring. We know that's not true. You can't um, just get a bigger claw just because you use it more. And beyond that, just because you got a bigger claw because you used it more, even if that was possible, you can't pass that on to your offspring um, because that's got to be something genetic. So Lamarck didn't really know that. His theory has been shown to be wrong, but he had um, proposed that idea overall that if you use an organ, then it'll get bigger and you'll pass down the trait of having that bigger organ. It's kind of a, a theory of use or use it or lose it type of um, theory, but it's not correct biologically. So Charles Darwin, he actually starts to get the right idea and he's in the mid 1800s. What he does is he takes this trip around the world. You can see his route here um, on the map. He leaves from England and he travels down around South America. And then he comes across the Pacific Ocean. He goes through Australia, down to the tip of South Africa, and then all the way back up to Europe. So he goes on this um, journey over several years um, on the HMS Beagle, which is the name of his boat. You can see a picture of it there. Um, he, he travels to the Galapagos Islands, and that's the main place where he starts making a lot of discoveries. The Galapagos Islands are off of the coast of South America. They're right here. He took the boat, the HMS Beagle, to get to the Galapagos Islands. Now, once he was at the Galapagos Islands, he looks at all different types of things. He looks at fossils, he looks at rocks and plants and animals. Some of the main animal species he looked at were tortoise and finches, which are a type of bird. And he notices something about these finches. What he notices is that on each island, there are different food sources. So on certain islands, there are large seeds. On certain ones, there's um, cactus. On other ones, there's little um, flower buds that they're going to eat. And the other ones have certain insects that they eat. And what he notices is that not only are there different food sources on the different islands, but the finches have different beak shapes on the islands. And so he comes up with this idea that maybe they came from one original species of finch that originally went and traveled from South America over to the Galapagos Islands. Remember, it's an island that's near South America. So he thinks that a species of finch flew from here in South America over to the Galapagos Islands and that it was one original species, but that that species went and lived on the different islands that were nearby each other in the Galapagos. And that on different islands where there was different foods, the finches developed different beaks so that they could better eat those different foods. Um, but he thinks, hmm, maybe they came from one original type of finch, but they got different beaks based on what they eat. So if they ate fruit, they maybe had a bigger beak. If they ate um, insects like grubs, maybe they ate had a smaller beak because they would need that smaller beak to reach into um, like holes in the tree or something like that. So he, he thinks maybe they came from one original finch that came from South America, but because of the different food sources on the different islands, they adapted to have different beak shapes so that they could be best at eating their foods. But he was kind of in the early works of this. He returns home and he studies a little bit more about plants and animals at home and different animal breeders like dog breeders kind of show him that there are differences that are passed on from the parent dogs onto the baby dogs um, when, when they're breeding puppies. 
And he says, huh, those differences are kind of important. That's interesting that they're passed from the mother and father dog to the baby puppy. Um, so maybe there's some sort of inheritance going on there. He's getting into the idea of genetics. Um, he also, as he works with breeders and plant farmers, he comes up with this idea of artificial selection. Artificial selection means that nature provides variation, um, meaning nature provides different opportunities for different um, plants or animals to exist, but humans select the variations that they find useful or that they prefer in farming or dog breeding. So if we look at that, you can see that possibly from one original plant species that started being farmed, certain farmers specialized in um, having large buds and that created cabbage. Certain farmers specialized in having lateral buds, which resulted in Brussels sprouts. Certain farmers specialized in having a stem that was larger, so they ended up with kohlrabi. Certain farmers select for larger leaves, they end up with kale. Certain farmers select for um, stems and flowers that look a certain way and they end up with broccoli and others look at flower clusters, they end up with cauliflower. So from one original plant found in nature, it's possible that different farmers chose to kind of breed together, for example, breed together the plants that had the biggest leaves. And if you keep breeding the plants that have the biggest leaves over many, 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 many generations, you might move from having this species of plant that have kind of a different look to having kale plant species. So over a long time, we would have selected for maybe bigger leaves and ended up with kale, while some other farmer would have selected for um, certain terminal buds and ended up with cabbage. It happens in animals too, like dogs. So if you were a dog breeder and you had all these different types of dogs, but you wanted to um, end up making small puppies, um, you know, smaller dogs like the teacup size, what you would do is you would only breed those dogs from the original generation who are smaller. These dogs are bigger, so you wouldn't breed them. So then the next generation, again, you look for the ones that are the smallest. So don't breed that guy. He's too big. These guys are a little smaller, so breed them. Don't breed them. They're too big. And then eventually you get generations, years and years and years and years and years, many generations later, that are all very small. And that's how you end up going from dogs that are very large to having certain breeders who specialize in the teacup size dogs. So in artificial selection, nature provides the variation, but humans choose what they want. So they choose large leaves to make kale, or they choose smaller dogs to breed to make um, toy teacup poodles. So he notices all this from the animal breeders and the farmers, but he also is getting influenced by other scientists like James Hutton. James Hutton says, hey, um, the earth is actually millions of years old. There's different um, geological things that have been going on on earth that kind of let us know that earth is very, very old. And um, before that, some scientists had thought that earth was pretty young, like not really that old. So um, he says, hey, earth is really old and things have been going on here for a while. Um, Thomas Malthus is a scientist in the late 1700s, and he's kind of um, an alarmist, like a panicked scientist. He says human population is increasing. It's increasing really, really, really fast, and we're eventually going to run out of living space and food to eat. So Darwin says, hmm, this could be true for every species. Like it could be true for finches. It could be true for dogs. It could be true for insects, all that sort of thing. And so if we're going to run out of living space, hmm, there might be competition and only the best will survive. Next up, he's influenced by Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell says, hey, I agree with James Hutton that the earth is millions of years old, but not only that, but we also have the same processes happening now that have been happening for a long time. So like volcanoes are happening now, but they also happened a really long time ago, like millions of years ago. And Darwin's like, could this be true for living things? Like, could animals that are breeding and being selected for the best um, of their species, that could that have been happening a long time ago? So really the best has been selected for millions and millions and millions of years. And that's how we've ended up with what we have. Another scientist who influenced Darwin was Alfred Wallace. He um, writes to Darwin in a letter and he talks about the idea of evolutionary change, um, which Darwin is getting to. And he, um, Alfred Wallace, had been studying in Malaysia, which is in um, the Pacific. And so he was kind of across the world from Darwin. Darwin was um, in the Galapagos Islands near South America. And 
um, Alfred Wallace was in Malaysia, which is near Asia. And so Darwin starts to put these ideas together and he's like, hmm, well, if Alfred Wallace was noticing the same things that I was noticing, this must be happening all over the world. And also I better publish something real quick because I don't want Alfred Wallace to go ahead and publish it and get credit for the idea of the theory of evolution. So Darwin in 19, or sorry, 1859 publishes On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. That's a book that explains basically all of his ideas that started in the Galapagos Islands and continued when he returned to Europe and read about other scientists. But what he comes up with is that over a long enough period of time, so keyword long time, natural selection can modify a population and end up making new species. He only uses the word evolution on the last page of his book. So his I ideas are on the origin of species, like how do new species come about? He didn't necessarily focus on the idea of evolution, but he, he was asking the question, where do new species come from? And he also points out that natural selection is not by itself evolution. It is just one way that evolution might happen. So natural selection, we'll talk about more um, in the next video. That's basically that um, only the best will survive and reproduce to make the next generation. That is one way that we think that certain species may have evolved, but it's not the only way that it might happen. So um, that's Darwin's big ideas. Now, later on, another scientist, Stephen Jay Gould, has added on to the idea of, of evolving species, but he's added another aspect of it. Stephen Jay Gould has been working in the time when um, bacteria are reproducing. And he sees, hey, bacteria are changing really quickly in response to the antibiotics that humans are using. Stephen Jay Gould says, all right, basically bacteria stay the same for a long time, but then doctors come up with an antibiotic and they expose the bacteria to the antibiotic and that bacteria very quickly, very rapidly changes and um, becomes a new species that is resistant to the antibiotic. And that goes on for a while and doesn't change. And then we introduce a new antibiotic and that bacteria evolves and changes to overcome that new antibiotic. And then it keeps continuing to go unchanged for a long period of time until we make a new antibiotic. So he has this idea where um, organisms can go through rapid change or become new species very quickly and then over a long period of time, just stay the way that they are until there's some new pressure from the outside world, um, which would make them speed up and change again. So it's kind of quick burst of change followed by a long time of remaining the same. This is in contrast to Darwin's ideas because Darwin thought that this kind of um, change over time or emergence of new species could only happen very gradually and over a really long period of time. So um, here's an image that kind of shows that difference. In um, Darwin's idea is gradual change over time. It kind of shows how this butterfly, if it were to gradually change over time to become this butterfly, it would do it little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit. What Stephen Jay Gould said would be, if you started with the same original butterfly, you could still get the same um, new butterfly. But what would have happened is that this one would have gone unchanged for a long period of time. And then some pressure in the environment would cause this new butterfly to be um, quickly evolved and then continue on. And that that could happen at any point due to some large pressure in the world for the butterfly to change quickly. So this is the gradualism idea and this is the punctuated equilibrium idea. Thank you so much for listening.